Thanks for joining us Behind the Frontline, a podcast providing timeless solutions to everyday workforce and workplace challenges. Frontline Training Solutions is an express employment professionals company, strategically placed between the workplace and the workforce with professionals standing by, ready to combat your unique challenges. Learn more about what we do at FrontlineOn.com. Thanks for joining us again for Behind the Frontline, a podcast hosted by Frontline Training Solutions, where we talk about real solutions for everyday unique challenges plaguing the workforce and the workplace. And today we are talking all about emotional intelligence. And I am sitting here with some of the world thought leaders Uh. on on, on emotional intelligence. Some of my favorite people. I'm sitting here with Nathan Lehman, Managing Director for Frontline. Say hi, Nathan. Hello. Hello. And I'm sitting here with Lorraine Medici, the Director of Training and Development. Good morning or afternoon. Yeah, exactly. Depending. And then I'm sitting here with Dana Neff, our Senior Facilitator and Client Relationship Manager. Hello, everyone. (laughs) Awesome. And I'm the Creative Director here at Frontline Training Solutions. And we're going to dive in. And so the first question that we have today is, I'd love to set some framework for this. Lorraine, if you could jump in, what is emotional intelligence? My favorite definition of emotional intelligence is uh, what we think and do about the way we feel. Mm -hmm. I mean, in class, I'll ask people to really kind of gnaw on that slowly, what we think and do about the way we feel. The doing is hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we were getting a little triggered before we are having this, yeah, this we podcast. May have, we podcast. may have been starting this podcast a little, a little tri- triggered. <laughs> <laughs> which, which speaks to the, the, the messiness of being a human being. Exactly. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you, when, you opened it out, when you opened up, you said uh, dealing with those things that are plaguing the workforce and the workplace, and I think emotional intelligence is probably one of the biggest, or lack of mm-hmm. emotional intelligence is what's plaguing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for leaders and for people who don't have formal leadership responsibility, yeah, just, it's really for yeah. all of us oh. to be thinking about how do we, how do we do that? Yeah. yeah, and I like the do part of it. Yeah, right, because it is about actions and behaviors mm-hmm. too. You can see, you know, when people are emotionally intelligent and maybe when they're not, it's on display. Mm. I think there's an additional level to that, though, the learning and actions and behaviors, because there's that self-awareness part of emotional intelligence. That was, I feel like that was the beginning of my journey when I started going through DISC and learning about who I was and how I work. That was an epiphany for me. So I think the learning part, in addition to the how I do and how I respond, I think Mm -hmm. the learning is a commitment we have to make as human beings. Mm. To interact with each other. Yeah, I think self-awareness is so important to that. And I'd love to hear your experiences, all of you, of the moment that you learned about emotional intelligence and that self-awareness became reality. Mm. Mm. I I think when we're talking about emotional intelligence at a foundational level, we're looking at those four pillars of self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. Um, and, and all the reading will suggest that self-awareness is probably the most important because if you don't get who you are at a fundamental level, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, <laughs> how do you know how to manage it, right? Um, so um, very similar to you, Dana, when I learned about emotional intelligence was when I was going through coaching, um, my coaching program, and it was just like, ha! Huh! Wow, that was like, it it just like, it was like memories and situations with people and why um, I didn't connect or with somebody um, or issues I had with my my kids or an employer. Immediately, I could see the light bulb moment. Um, Where I struggle, quite honestly, and you guys all know this, um, and I was told this before the podcast, is um, (laughs) self-management. Right, Nick? (laughs) Uh, Well, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) As I was told, oh, you can tell. And and I know that, right? Um, And it's it's just a a work in progress. I I think one thing I want to just say, and I'll let you guys chime in here. Emotional intelligence is not a destination. 
Mm-hmm. It's not something you ever go, ooh, I'm, I'm, I'm here at A and I just need to get to C. It's like there is no Z. It's constant. As soon as you think you're all that in a bag of chips, right? Um, life will throw a curveball. Something ball. happens. Kind of yeah. reminds me of like a, a ship on the waves at yeah. sea. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and you just got to realize there's going to be things that pop up in your life and the strategies you were using... Mm-hmm maybe are no longer working. And and that's why I think emotional intelligence, if you wrestle to try to get perfect, um, th- that just doesn't exist. I, um, that reminds me of uh, a few years ago, um, I was leaving um, a traumatic work situation and some life events that left me with a little PTSD and I went and saw a counselor for it. And as I was talking to the counselor, he um, kept interrupting me as I would talk about, you know, um, some experiences and some feelings that I were feeling and I was trying to str- deal with this and get over this. And, um, he would say, well, that part of you. And I'm like, Oh, okay. And I would keep talking and I'd keep sharing my experience. And he'd say, well, that part of you felt that. And I was like, what do you mean by that? That part of me. And then he explained to me that that feeling that I was feeling that emotional trigger, that mm-hmm. experience was just a part of me mm. and a part of what I was feeling. And what I needed to do was acknowledge it, give it room to breathe Mm. and then set it down. And that was like a light bulb moment for me. And that self-awareness that what I'm experiencing right now is not forever. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I can get over. It's something that I can self soothe from. Um, yeah. What would you say to that? Well, I, I I think what you're explaining to everybody is it's a snapshot in time, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And just listening to that, I think that is wonderful. And it gives you perspective to go, okay, this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, what do I need to do? And sometimes it is to soothe that. I think we'll kind of get into that a little bit later. But um, um, it's recognizing that it doesn't have to encompass every part of who you are Mm -hmm. or define every part of who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. So you asked, when when did self-awareness kind of start? coming clear for me mm-hmm. um and the thing that I, I i like about the idea of self-awareness is that it is one of those ongoing growth things but you can be really wrong about what you think about yourself and that was clear for me so my journey started in actually you mentioned disc uh, i'm going to mention the mbti tool so myers-briggs type indicator great tool not the end all be all of everything but a good tool for a purpose the first time I took it, I, I came back as an ESTJ, and I don't want to get into too many details with it, but the E stands for extroverted. And if you know me, I'm not an extrovert, but I came across that way because I actually had a really strong bias for extroversion. I was in leadership development at the time. I was up in front of people all the time. I had to network and connect, and I just kind of assumed that meant I had to be an extrovert. Yeah. And then I went to the certification class and realized none of that applied to me. I'm very, I'm very much an introvert and I had to actually go through a little bit of a process to be okay with who I actually Mm. am. Hmm. And I think that's part of self-awareness. One, being open to what you think about yourself may not always be accurate. And then having the right tools, resources, relationships, others, to help you see reality more clearly. Now, the funny thing is I come home and I'm all excited about what I've learned and I'm talking to my wife and I, I said, you know, did you know I'm not an extrovert? And she's like, uh, yeah, I could have told you that. You know, <laughs> How much do you pay for this training? I could have <laughs> right, right. saved some money or whatever. Uh, so, you know, other people, especially those who know you really well, yeah. it'd be a great resource to help yeah. you start on the journey of awareness and I think, but I also think it starts with being open to the fact that maybe what you think isn't a hundred percent clear yeah. hmm. and a hundred percent accurate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That brings me to the experience I had with purpose driven leadership training here at frontline with Lorraine is that when we were in the assessment part of it, it was a complete and total epiphany for me when my quadrant came up as social awareness being my lowest score. Hmm. I never would have guessed that. I've been on an other-centered leadership journey my last 10 years of my life, 
yet this assessment at the end of that 10 years is telling me I have work to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's that moment of vulnerability to say, I'm willing to step into this space Mm -hmm. to learn more about myself so that I can look in the mirror and say, all right, you're triggered. A value has been challenged. Now, what are you going to do about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just love that you've planted all of those seeds in me with that class experience over eight weeks. I mean, every week it was this learning opportunity to learn more and more and more and dig deeper and deeper. And I just love that layered learning experience. So, you know, I just feel like any emotional intelligence training that we encourage people to take or that you would consider taking as an individual, make sure that it's it's going to be a, a, a meaningful experience that really helps you dive in and dig in mm-hmm. to the truth of who we are. Um, love that. I want to um, take a second. If one of you could explain what a trigger is mm-hmm. um, and not take it a step further, um, how do we recognize that and become self-aware of our triggers and acknowledging those for future situations? Mm-hmm. So maybe just define what is a trigger? Well, I I mean, I think a trigger is an emotional reaction that feels unbalanced, if you will. I know you like that term, and I like that term too. And and kind of throws you. Um, I always like to kind of uh, use it on a scaling purpose, like if, if I get triggered by poor customer service or is something that does trigger me that all of a sudden I can not only think about it I I sense the feeling about it first even though what actually is happening are our thoughts that kind of um, shift us to our feelings but sometimes it's at a visceral level do you ever get that where it's like 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 I get either tense in my shoulders or it's usually my gut and I'm not happy right so I think it's an emotional reaction to something where there's um, there's no thought to it. It's just, it's, it's just a heightened feeling. Mm-hmm. You're out of sorts. You're out of sorts. Yeah. yeah you uh, don't have that balance. That's right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and now you're kind of living in the emotions, mm. whatever those are, anger, sadness, yeah. um, mm-hmm. you know, shame, whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. And I was mentioning before we started that the kind of the kind of extreme of triggering is the hijack. Yeah. Right? Mm. And so talk, define hijack for a second, then I've got a story. That yeah. Share. So when you think about hijack, what what does that mean? So I, we, we talk about this a lot in class because I think it's important to know that it is absolutely 100% normal to be triggered. Mm-hmm. Um, that trigger is part of our uh, survival. We go, whoa. That like that was not safe. What you just did in cutting me off, right? Um, so you can get triggered, and I think triggers um, can have different levels of intensity. Hijack though is when the trigger now all of a sudden really impacts everything. It's like you you are just swirling, and and Nate's laughing because he knows I was swirling this week, <laughs> um, swirling in those emotions, and and it's a long time that you feel. Uh, the intensity of yeah. it. And, and you can't really think. You're just feeling. That's and I right. think that's important is that if there's a difference between thinking and feeling. Um, and just real quick before you yeah. jump into your story, yeah. I, I was thinking about somebody in class who was very triggered about this topic that we were talking about, which I love. I'm like, good, just feel whatever you want. And I said, what is it that you're thinking about right now that's getting you out of sorts? And the way they responded was, well, I feel like you're kind of um, looking at my trigger in a certain way. And I said, I understand that, but how are you thinking about it? And they couldn't answer because they were so fixated on how they're feeling. And I know we've all been there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So talk about your Yeah. So this is and- totally not work related and doesn't have any to do with anybody on in the podcast. Mm-hmm. It was just me, an experience I had that I have reflected on many times. So... And I think this illustrates that being hijacked can happen at any time for us, right? So even when things are okay and things are going normal or whatever. So um, we were traveling and and my wife and I were being dropped off at the airport by my son. Um, And we got to the airport. He dropped us off. 
and we were walking inside he pulls away and i realize i don't have my backpack it's in his car oh all right yikes and he's driving away and of course you know i never feel like there's enough time in an airport i'm the kind of guy that gets there really early and my wife is like let's get there at the very last minute possible, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right so we're probably already there later than i want to be and i'm envisioning my son driving away and it taking a long time for him to get back to the airport get me the bag that I actually really needed for my trip. How I know I was hijacked was I was physically incapable of dialing his phone number. Oh, wow. Like I pulled oh, out wow. my phone and I'm like this. I'm shaking oh. and I'm, I'm trying, like I could, <laughs> because I was so worried that I wouldn't have what I needed, so pressed for time in the travel in the airport and of course, airports aren't fun anyway and i i just didn't even know what to do and this was he if he would have gotten home it would have been like 45 minutes one way right and yeah. then, so there's no way it would have so thankfully you know i was able to get the phone dialed and talk to him and get it back and he was able to get back so the story ends well but i just remembering like that's my story. brain can't make my hand do what I need to do because I'm so lost in this very moment. At yeah. that point, I I was completely hijacked. Now, I could have probably turned to my wife and say, hey, can you call Jordan? <laughs> <laughs> she'd be like, why don't you call Jordan? But you couldn't even think that. Mm -mm. Yeah, you couldn't the even come up think, with that I thought. I got to get a hold of Jordan, but I can't get my phone. Wow, yeah. It's yeah. Like, fascinating like, yeah. To, to know that our emotions and our reactions in a moment can have that kind of a physical mm -hmm. impact on yeah. us. Wow. Well, and I think you've seen me do that with technology. Oh, um, yeah. When when I was having some, <laughs> they're laughing. Be nice, be nice. But when, when I have to do something with virtual training or a Zoom call and it's not up and running, I just sit there and I'm frozen. Mm -hmm. And that's probably a little bit how you felt. It's just like, I don't know what to think. And in your brain, in, in the prefrontal cortex, actually does shut down when you, and you've, we've all probably said, I can't think right now. It's because you can't think. Um, and, and I get really stuck and I've had to go, okay, I just have to breathe. I have to work through that, you know, learn how to calm down. But yeah, that's a great story. Well, it is. I think there's, I think there's a, a real good truth for all of us to recognize is it's going to happen. Yeah. It's going to happen yes. to you. You're a human being. You're going to get hijacked at some point. Yeah. Um, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not, you know, just you. It's not wrong. It just is. Yeah. And we've got That's to a recognize good way of exactly. That. That's a good way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then I like what you're saying, like start to breathe recognize when it's happening, start to breathe. It's oftentimes in that moment though, which is why I think the time pressure was such an issue for me that you, you almost feel like you, you can't move fast enough. Well, the fact of the matter is you can't move. So be yeah, okay exactly. with that mm -hmm. and start to step back and take a breath. Now, yeah. at the end of the day, would the world have ended if I couldn't take that backpack with me? Like literally, no. Right. It probably would have caused some challenges and issues, but I'd probably still be alive, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah those I love would still be alive, you know, but you could just get lost. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I did um, that's very helpful for me when I'm in my emotional place is I am a visual learner. And so I was taught a visual model of that out of balance space that you referenced. And the visual model is that we all are, are human beings. We have this bubble of emotions and logic. Mm. And in our normal physiological state, that bubble stays in pretty good balance. It's those moments that we're paralyzed that the bubble is full of emotion. And what we think we should be able to do is, in a hole in the top of that bubble, cram more logic in oh. and talk myself through this. Mm. And what I realized is when you're in that full bubble space, the only thing you can do is just stop for a moment and recognize my bubble is full of emotion right now. I have to recognize that and own it. And now I maybe I can start to pull through mm. and find my way back to a more balanced space where logic has some room here. Mm. And I can actually think again because mm -hmm. there was no thinking going on at that mm -hmm. moment for you. Okay. And mm. I love that you mentioned that it's a very human response because physiologically, 
That's exactly what's happening. Yeah. Our blood pressure escalates, our body temperature rises, mm -hmm. our heart rate increases. There's a real experience there mm -hmm. as humans. Yeah. And That's and funny. I appreciate you saying it. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Yes. I mean, I teach this stuff probably six, eight times a month. And you would think that I got my stuff together when it comes to <laughs> self-regulating my emotions. Yeah. And it is a lot better than it was, mm -hmm. but yeah, it still kind of floors me yeah. mm -hmm. that intellectually I can get it. And then all of a sudden I'm in, in that moment. And, and, and Nick, I just want to, I want to say something because you're said like, what is, what are triggers? And mm -hmm. I think we have to go, well, where do they come from? <laughs> right. Triggers don't just manifest themselves just right. And it, it comes down to values that are being threatened or compromised. So I'm thinking about you. I'm going to ask you when that situation was happening with you at the airport, what was mm. most on your mind that made you get to that freeze point? What were you thinking? Yeah, I think it was I wouldn't be prepared for what the trip was intended to be. Like I, it really was important that I have it. Not the end of the world if I didn't, but that I had that and that I would let other people down. Yeah. Mm. Let myself down, but let other people down because I didn't have the resources I would need for that trip. Yeah. Mm. So just listening to what Nate's saying, it's like, Preparation is important mm -hmm. to you. A consideration for other people, mm -hmm. whatever was in that bag might have supported them, mm -hmm. right? So there was that sense of uh, those values now being threatened mm -hmm. that causes us to get triggered. Mm -hmm. Now, for somebody else, they'd be like, so I'll go buy another backpack because the, the, the values <laughs> may not be as important for them, those same values. And we've talked about that for you in technology. Yeah, yeah. What's your value when you're in the Oof. middle of a class and the technology's not working and you got people sitting there. I don't want to inconvenience people. I don't want them to have a bad experience. Yeah. See, look at what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. Like it hurts my heart, even mm -hmm. though most people are like, everybody gets that technology. Even when I am the recipient in a situation where, but I don't sit there and go, wow, you need to have your stuff together here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's just, it, it consumes me at times. Well, let me ask a question. Um, think about some tools that maybe you guys could give to our listeners um, on how to acknowledge those triggers and prepare for future situations. I heard one time the idea of a stress journal and writing down in the moment those mm. stressors. And obviously, if there's a physical response, I'm not going to write it down. <laughs> but maybe coming back and mm. retrospectively thinking, yeah. you know, that was a trigger for me. Let me write this down. Mm. Let me think about this. Um, and for me, when I get triggered, I retreat, I get very mm -hmm. quiet, I get very mm -hmm. silent, and that's when Lorraine has become my emotional lifeguard in some sorts because she knows immediately when I am triggered, I'm not talking to anybody. I'm going to close my door, I'm going to turn the lights off, and I'm going to stare at my computer screen in yeah, your silence. whole face looks different. My whole yeah. face looks different. It's, it, it, it can feel, oh, don't approach mm -hmm. Nick right now. Yeah. And I think um, one of the things that I think is important for us is when I'm in that moment, what I'm thinking through in my head is I'm giving myself shame. I am, mm -hmm. I'm angry at myself. Like, why did I react that way? Why is this so, you know, such a problem for me? Yeah. And so maybe there's some other tools, kind of like a stress journal or whatever you guys think. Um, and then I want to come back to recognizing those triggers in others mm -hmm. to become a coaching leader for them. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. so good. That's so good. What do, what you shared, uh, Dana, uh, I think beautifully said is acknowledging I, my emotional bubble is completely full. There is no room to put anything. And what you're looking to do is drain some of that. You gotta, that's what yeah. I would say is a tool. That's yeah. exactly what I was going to say is mine is all about trust. Mm -hmm. And I look for my trusted people in my circle of care. Cause I need to vent. Mm -hmm. I, I need somebody to let, I need to be in a space that's safe. I need to unpull that. I need to pull that plug. Mm -hmm. And I need to vent, let that emotion out. And now I can start. And if I'm, I'm with a listener, it's even better because they're going to help me work through that ambivalence, that space of, of just out of control, uncertainty, don't know what's next. I just need to take a step forward. I don't know what that step's going to be. I just want to be with a trusted person yeah. and mm -hmm. have that moment to 
vent. And I, in my trusted circle of care, I'll actually have people and Lorraine, you're one of them, Nate, you too, um, that I walk in and say, I don't need you to fix this right now. I just need to vent. Yeah. Hmm. Do you think that just putting it out there in the open makes it yes. real? Yes. And then you can like set goals and plan and, and get help for it. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think what it says is, I trust you. Mm -hmm. And number two is, I trust you because I know I can come in here and say exactly what I need to say, what I'm really feeling, and you're not going to judge me, and you're not going to hold it against me. You're just accepting that I am in a very human place right now, and you just are going to be there with me yeah. and, let, and okay. hear me and let me you know, talk it out. It's, it's, it it kind of makes me think about your example, um, Nick, when you said in that experience of a previous employer where it's just like, it, it, it's the whole picture. It, mm -hmm. It's not, it's a snapshot. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'm hearing trust, right. Uh, safety, psychological safety with somebody. What about for you? What are some of your, yeah, I, I think about being willing to talk proactively about times where you're experiencing some significant stress, um, to help others, in your circle of safety or your team, your coworkers or whatever, understand where you might be coming from. Because I think the, the triggering and the outbursts that come sometimes when we're under stress are partly the impact of those things comes from the fact that nobody knows or they're not picking up on your cues. But if you can proactively let people know, hey, uh, this is what's kind of happening right now. And of course, I get that's not going to be safe for everybody to do or people to feel comfortable to do that. But the more you're able to identify times of additional stress or challenge and let people know who you're working with closely, that this is what you're going through, I think that can help. But it requires that you're aware of it. Yes. And you, it requires that you are able to communicate it and you have the right circle around you to do that. Um, some of those things take time to build. But if you can be upfront and uh, candid with people about what's going on, that can also help. Hmm. And I think that for the listeners, what you just described is the self-awareness and the self-management. And mm. you did that this week mm. when you shared with all of us, you said, and it was even mm. your words. And I think that's important. I want to be transparent mm. to let you know that I've got a lot on my plate. I want to still be there for you, but just be aware that I may not be able to just necessarily drop everything. And that was so helpful um, for the social awareness part, when I think, because Nate and I, and you you are right across, to not just be, you know, to just have that little bit of a thought to go, remember, he's he kind of put it out there. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of my tools in jumping off that is using words, um, to kind of lay the foundation. A, a lot of times I use the words, I'm struggling right now. Uh, so it's my way of going, I'm gonna to try to kind of put the olive branch out there and go, this isn't gonna look very pretty about what I'm about to say, but I am struggling right now, as opposed to saying, I don't like the way you did X, Y, and Z, or I don't like the way the direction is. I, I try, and I know I'm not as good as I'd like to be, but try by saying, I'm struggling with this, I feel, I usually try to bring out a value that I think is being compromised mm. that I'm really struggling with. So um, one amazing strategy that a master coach, and you, you might remember this, that I shared in the Developing Coaching Leaders, uh, is that sometimes that hijack can last for days, mm. maybe even weeks. Mm. I'm sure there are people... Mm. And, that is, and I've been one of those people who just hang on to something. And yes, you can still function, but it's always right there, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember her saying that, and to your point, at that point, you got to go time out. I'm going to give myself the next mm, 24 to 36 hours, not indefinitely, but she, she usually put it at the high end 36 hours and you specifically state a time. So if I was really hijacked right now, more than triggered, but hijacked, I would say by noon tomorrow, Saturday at noon, this is done between now and then I can feel and think and, you know, do anything as long as it's legal. <laughs> um, <laughs> whatever I want to feel, 
to the mm-hmm. intensity I want to feel, but at noon it's done. And I, when I first, I'm like, oh, I don't know. This sounds a little fluffy. I have used that probably 10 times over the course of 10 years, and it has helped every time about an hour to an hour and a half before that time. It's like the brain goes, okay, mm-hmm. now I can have de-escalated. Some of that emotional bubble is you know, starting to shrink, and now I can use some of that logic to go, now how will I deal with that? Mm-hmm. So it, it's helped me so many times, so mm-hmm. let me throw that out there. Mm-hmm. I think I have another tool too, Nick, that Good. that that was introduced to me by Lorraine and PDLT, and that is the um, the above and below the line. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's in that self-management quadrant, and in that space of, okay, I've recognized, I'm hijacked, now what do I do? because I can't think, I'm only emotional. The one thing I know I can do is to remind myself of three words Mm -hmm. and go, you know, go below the line. Are you, you know, is this a villain, a victim or a hero? hero? Yeah, let's explain the above the line, below the line a little bit. And for all the viewers on YouTube, I'll put the image on the screen right now. So Lorraine, can you explain this a little bit? Well, it's a model that's been out there for a while, and it, it basically is a wonderful way to, and I, I'm not a fan of labels, but in this case, it, it uh, helps you identify and recognize where you are when you get triggered, when you get hijacked, so that I can kind of start to slowly recognize that, okay, I, I'm in a victim state, which has a lot of I statements. I feel like I can't. I don't know how. I'm not sure. I don't feel like people are listening to me. You will find yourself in that victim mode when you, you're using a lot of that I statements. Villain mode has much more energy. Um, it's going to be directed, pointing, blaming. It's not my issue. It's so-and-so's issue. So you are going to definitely see more energy. And, and I could feel very villain this week. I was just just like this is not making sense right and i it was it was just swirling in there the third one which has kind of a, a you know you think well what what why would a hero be wrong um hero mode is when you are doing something where you kind of stretch yourself because you get something out of it a lot of times we would see this maybe where you have an employee who's not working as well and you just like you know i'll take care of that i'll just do it because in my mind i'm like i can do it better i can do it faster i don't need to deal with this so it gives me some relief right but what have we just done for that employee Mm -hmm. exactly Mm -hmm. so that's kind of up below when our when our emotional intelligence is down if I can recognize, oh, I'm sitting here, and we use this language, as you know, here, I can go, Nate, I am like total villain right now. He can then kind of coach me, like, what's that all about, right? Above the line are the opposite. So if I'm in that victim mentality, uh, the opposite is called a creator. So you're trying to create energy. Typically with that victim mindset, there's very little um energy and and you feel you can feel apathetic right and so if i can go okay what's one thing that i can do between now and 12 i use a lot of timetables for me because it helps my brain kind of go okay we're we're just we just got two hours what what can i just do in these two hours the opposite of villain is the challenger i actually think villain is probably the hardest one it's really challenging mindsets the where am I wrong? How am I not seeing this? What perspective am I missing that this other person is seeing that I'm not? Um, what if I just let this go? What if, what if we do fail? And so it's really challenging this lane that sometimes gets to have blinders on it. And then lastly, the opposite of hero is being a coach, is either asking yourself some questions or asking the other person, um, helping them think through that. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about, um, um, hopefully by now, all of our viewers and participants and listeners um, are understanding the importance of emotional intelligence and self-awareness in ourselves. But I want to talk for a second about the importance of understanding that as a leader Mm -hmm. and the importance of understanding the emotional intelligence health of your team and how to coach them through some of the triggers that they may be feeling and being aware of that. And then I want to come back to a story okay. that I have. Nice. Well, I can jump in yes, a please. little bit, just kind of start. Um, I do think as a leader, one of your roles is to help 
foster an environment of awareness for others, you know, so that obviously requires that you have some level of personal awareness, but then to be kind of a mirror for other people, not in the sense that you're playing back to them, the emotion that you're getting, but you're showing them potentially the emotion that they're expressing towards others, helping them see it. I just go back to when we talked about being triggered or hijacked or whatever. Sometimes we don't even know that we're doing that. And so as a leader, I think one of the things we have to be uh, mindful of is when do I need to help my people see the things that they're not able to see themselves? Mm -hmm. And that requires you to notice it, but it also requires you to take the time to sit down with them and talk through it. And not, and not like a passing thing, right? These are things you got to have an intentional conversation about. It's going to require you to listen really, really well, um, actively listen, reflect back. This is what I'm hearing you say. Is, am I understanding where you're at? Um, but this is where, these are some of the things that are coming across to other people. Are you aware of that? What's that about? Is that how you want to be perceived by yeah, other people? Good question. Mm -hmm. Right? So I think there's a little bit of that reflection, I would say, a start. Yeah, and I think you're also saying, thinking about what's the impact. And you and I had that conversation this week. And um, to your credit, you just uh, really, that act of listening, it felt safe to be able just to kind of emotionally feel ugly for a minute. Mm -hmm. And then it took me a day or two to go, okay, now, what can I do differently? Mm -hmm. You know, I think empathy has a lot to do with it, too. Oh, yes. You know, That's seeing good. it as other people see it, feeling it as other people feel it. And the most important part, recognizing this is their truth, not mine. Mm -hmm. And the idea of just being in a space of acceptance, if you're the leader that's on the receiving side of the out of balance space of my emotional intelligence is, is active right now. Mm -hmm. And my emotions are large and in charge. And if we can empathize with the folks that are in our circle of care that have chosen us to be their listener at this moment, and remember, I know what that's like. I know what it's like to be emotionally hijacked. I remember how paralyzed I felt. I remember the physical ramifications. I think if we can empathize with people, just at a human level, we can be so much better for each other. <laughs> the other thing I think I've noted about what we're talking about today and, and the thing that I think is one of the advantages we have and for any team is we've made regular reference today about we all have a common language Mm -hmm. And we use it every day. And I think that for teams that are exploring, where do we begin? I think just going through something together, like an emotional intelligence experience, mm -hmm. and what you learn about yourself, but then what you learn about dynamically, how I contribute to my team, how I can connect with my leaders better, how I can connect with my teammates better the people I'm taking care of, the people I'm serving. I just feel like there's this opportunity for teams if they're looking for that where do I begin hmm. space that this might be where you can really have a good opportunity to, to grow your team's connection. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And, and I, we get a lot of people that will call for, hey, we just got team members who don't get along. There's no cohesiveness. They, they don't think like a unit. And so can you just can you just come in and do some training on communication? And you're right, Dana, a lot of it really has to start with, I got to look at me first. Mm -hmm. I will say this, emotional intelligence can be a little bit of a double edged sword, in that you can sit in a class and go, Oh, yeah, so and so is like that. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I really stress in class is to go, this is not about thinking about your boss or your teammate, or your wife or husband, this is about you first. And when I went through it, it was just, uh, yeah. I mean, I had to go back and make some apologies to people mm -hmm. because all of a sudden the light was on. So I think it's important to look at emotional intelligence is a personal development, lifelong journey. Mm. That's great. What was your story? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> interesting. So my story um, is, is about my eldest daughter. Um, in a situation that happened when she was about four, so about six or seven years ago. And I love what you were saying, Dana, about empathy. Um, and so my eldest daughter at that time was obsessed with My Little Pony. Too, like, obsessed with My Little Pony. <laughs> and about that time is when that movie came out. 
and we have never taken them to the movie theater because we felt like they were too young but we were like you know what this is the time let's take them to the movie we found out about it a few months before it came out every single day she talked about this movie every single day she was like when are we gonna go is it out yet and they're like no we got we got a couple months and so that anticipation that excitement was building up and on the day of we made it a big experience for her we took her to lunch um, her and her sister we took them to the mall bought them some toys and some gifts and some jewelry and um, they were like let's head to the theater and then she got so nervous and emotionally hijacked about the expectation and the fear of going into a dark theater that she had a very physical response. She was thrashing around. She was throwing a tantrum. I was carrying her through the parking lot. She kicked me in the face and sent my glasses flying a few parking spaces over. And at that point, I'm holding her, and we're asking that question, should we even do this? Should we go? Should we take her? Should we just say, let's go home? And I think, you know, especially as leaders, I personally feel, and I want to hear your input on this, it can become easy when someone is saying they're emotionally attacked if we don't have awareness of that to say, well, that's dumb, like mm. get over it, you know, yes. like, just do it this way. Mm. And so what happened in that moment was um, we could have made that decision. Let's just go home. She's not ready for this. Like you're not ready for this. But I said, no, let's go. Let's see what happens. Let's let's I'm going to I'm going to carry her in there. We're going to see what happens. So my wife and my other daughter, they went to the theater and they started the movie. And, and me and Lily just sat in the hallway of the theater and I just let her sit in her emotions for about 15 minutes. And I just asked her a few questions like, what are you nervous about? You know, what do you think is going to happen? Like, tell me about what you're feeling. And after about 15 minutes, she said, daddy, I want to go in. And we went in and she had a great time. Yeah. And so I think that idea of empathy, but also being curious mm -hmm. about what they're experiencing allowed me to kind of help hmm. coach her through That's this great story, this Nick. situation. Yes. So what would you say to, you know, those leaders that, because I've been in that situation before, you know, where I'm like, I don't understand what you're feeling. That is dumb. Like, just get over it, you know? Well, I think one of the biggest consequences of not um, empathizing and acknowledging what somebody's going through is a trust breaker, mm. what you said. If all of a sudden, I, if I, you being my, my boss, Nate, if I went, <sighs> I'm struggling and I'm, and I'm, I'm pretty open. So I'm going to just share what I'm going to share. And all of a sudden you're like, Lorraine, you need to get over it. In my mind, I would never probably go back to Nate again mm -hmm. and, and be vulnerable enough and open enough to talk to him. I'd be like, okay, that's my boss. He's telling me what to do, but I don't trust you. Mm -hmm. Think about if you would have done that with Lily, mm -hmm. right? It, it, even those formative years, mm -hmm. this, we don't teach kids. What we tell kids is to say, you know, behave better, you know, straighten up, which all are important things to do. But sometimes we have to be there on those snapshot situations to go, yeah, this is scary. It's your first time. Yeah. I think that's normal. Yeah. You almost have to normalize sometimes. Yeah. yeah. I love how you went into kind of a storytelling place with her and allowed her to kind of verbalize, hmm. asking her and kind of working through what like very coaching conversation with her mm -hmm. and to imagine she was just this little human, but you can still have this coaching conversation with yeah. your children just by letting her tell her story. Right. Yeah. 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 I was very curious in that moment of, okay, this is her first time experiencing this. What was my first time experiencing yeah. this like? Yeah. You know, I exactly. remember my first movie in the theater was Jurassic Park. Oh, gosh. oh so okay. I remember jumping out of my seat yeah, six yeah. feet in the air. Yeah. So I, I was like, yeah, this is scary. You know, like, let's talk about this. Yeah, exactly. It's that Brene Brown thing, the story we tell ourselves mm -hmm. that, you know, what is the story she's telling herself right now? Because in that space, we, what she teaches is that we go to this place as human beings, the story we tell ourselves is we start, we have a certain amount of context and we start building stories on that context, but there's a lot of information missing. Yeah. And so we start building up based on our own behavioral tendencies. We start building up this story, this we're authoring the story internally and you let her tell you the story yeah. that she was authoring internally that what that big dark scary room really involved mm. and i just think that's a beautiful story of just connecting at a human level with mm. your your daughter at such a tender age that's oh, yeah thank you well she loved the movie yeah oh. <laughs> well i think i think the other thing to remember is leaders have choices all the time 
between short term and long term thinking and acting. <sighs> and you know, you might at times go to the short term, just get over it. Maybe because you are busy, you don't have time for it. Maybe you're hijacked or whatever. But just think about the long term impact of that. You exactly. mentioned that on the trust side. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So we do it. Um, because we're trying to get to a better place faster and there's always a trade-off there's always a trade-off we're always talking to leaders about you don't get to make a cost-free decision ever about anything there's always the other side of your choice Mm -hmm. so if you stop pause and coach and you're like man this is taking more time than i have right now and i'm uncomfortable myself that's the cost if you don't and you go to the get it over get over with it it's maybe potentially a bigger cost with a longer term absolutely impact so mm-hmm. think about the short versus long term and almost all the t- always the long term is better yeah absolutely that's so good all right so um, we're going to land the plane and uh, final thoughts Lorraine I'd love to hear your final thoughts <clears throat> uh, final thoughts is to not beat yourself up. <laughs> I'm trying to say that to myself today. Um, to recognize that this is not a destination. Your emotional intelligence will ebb and flow, and some days will be better than others. Some weeks will be better. And just to recognize that this part of the messy human side of life, that said, have tools in your toolbox for sure. Mm-hmm. So good. Dana, final thought. Personal grace. Mm. Mm-hmm. You just have to be kinder to yourself because we're human and this stuff is going to happen. And so build a circle of care, build the trust, build the people around you so that you can have those moments of vulnerability and humanness in a space that where you're trusted and, and you can kind of ground yourself in that place of, okay, I know this stuff. I've learned, I have tools in my toolbox. I just have to find my way to the toolbox right now. Mm-hmm. So personal grace. Love that. Nathan. Yeah, I'm going to build off what Lorraine said and just say um, there are tools available. Um, We mentioned DISC. We mentioned Myers-Briggs. There's actually emotional intelligence assessments. There's training. There's a lot of resources uh, that can help you understand yourself better in the context of emotional intelligence, develop the right skills um, to be able to handle things more effectively. So I would just say find those tools, latch on to them, and start building out your toolbox. So good. You know, Nathan mentioned assessments in our prior podcast. We actually sat with Kristen Ekins and talked all about assessments. So we mm-hmm. encourage you to go listen to that. Um, but if you're interested in any of the tools that we can help you in your toolbox, um, join us on FrontlineOn.com. We have plenty of trainings and opportunities and assessments and webinars and all sorts of things geared towards emotional ass- intelligence and um, helping you become more emotionally intelligent and aware. Um, And we want to help you. Just like everyone said, it's a human response and you are not alone. And we are here to help you in that journey. Subscribe on YouTube, follow along with our podcast and contact us at frontlineon.com if you want to know more about anything you heard today. We will see you next time on Behind the Frontline.